We're continuing our series into the life of Joseph. This is week three of week five. If you were with us for the first two weeks, you remember we looked at the same story when Joseph received the coat of many colors, but was then thrown into a pit and eventually sold into slavery by his brothers. In the first week, we looked at it from the perspective of his brothers and just this idea of bitterness. Where did it go so wrong for the brothers? How did bitterness get a hold of their hearts? Uh, last week, we looked at it from Joseph's perspective and what must he have been thinking when he was down in that pit and then sold to the slave traders? Did God forget about me and what do we need to remember during those times? Well, we're going to move on to a new story this week. and We left last week with Joseph, as I mentioned, being sold to slave traders, and he's on his way to Egypt. And now, as we pick up this story in Genesis 39, he's in Egypt, and he's been purchased by Potiphar. Uh, Potiphar was the captain of the guard, uh, maybe the captain of the bodyguards for Pharaoh. Uh, there's no real indication of how much time has passed between when he was brought to Egypt and when this story picks up in Genesis 39, but uh, this story has several parts. Uh, the first part was smooth sailing. That's what we see here in these first few, verse, first few verses. Let's read together Genesis chapter 39, the first six verses. All right, are you ready? Here we go. Now Joseph had been taken to Egypt. An Egyptian named Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the guards, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, serving in the household of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made everything he did successful, Joseph found favor with his master and became his personal attendant. Potiphar also put him in charge of his household and placed all that he owned under his authority. From the time that he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph. The Lord's blessing was on all that he owned in his house and in his fields. He left all that he owned under Joseph's authority. He did not concern himself with any, anything except the food that he ate. As you can see, we've got some smooth sailing going on here. Uh, you know, Joseph's success in this part was due to God being with him. Uh, we see that in these verses. God had an active presence in Joseph's life. Uh, we're going to delve more into this idea of God being with Joseph uh, next week. Uh, but Potiphar saw that God was with Joseph, and then God made everything Joseph did successful. And because of that, he put him in charge of pretty much literally everything. It says in verse 6 that God significantly blessed the house of Potiphar because of Joseph, and Potiphar saw that. Well, the next part in these verses is that a storm is brewing. Let's pick it back up again in the end of verse 6. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. After some time, his master's wife looked longingly at Joseph and said, Sleep with me. But he refused. Look, he said to his master's wife, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in his house, and he has put all that he owns under my authority. No one in this house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. So how could I do this immense evil, and how could I sin against God? The storm is brewing. For Joseph, things are starting to take a little bit of a turn, and Joseph refused Potiphar's wife's advances for two reasons. He gives them to us here. The first is loyalty to his master. He knew that Potiphar trusted him. He knew that Potiphar had put him in charge of everything and entrusted his life to Joseph. He said, I can't go against that. I can't, I can't go against this loyalty that my master has shown to me. And the second reason that he refused the advances was because loyalty to God. His refusal was strengthened because he was convinced that God had called him to a special task. He'd seen evidence of that in this rise from slavery and where he was then and where he is now. And if he's going to fulfill God's plan, he can't sin against the God who's going to bring this all about. Well, let's keep reading because now there's trouble on the high seas. Verse 10, although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her. Now one day he went into the house to do his work and none of the household servants were there. She grabbed him by his garment and said, sleep with me. But leaving his garment in her hand, he escaped and ran outside. 
When she saw that he had left his garment with her and had run outside, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, my husband brought a Hebrew man to make fools of us. He came to me so that he could sleep with me, and I screamed as loud as I could. When he heard me screaming for help, he left his garment beside me and ran outside. You know, there's a few things that jump out to me in these, ver in these verses that I think are kind of interesting. Uh, one of the things is that this temptation from Potiphar's wife to Joseph, it was continuous. Like this wasn't just a one-time thing where he said no and then she shows up later uh, to do this. Uh, it says that in verse 10, she spoke to Joseph day after day. Day after day, continually, she kept coming to him and said, sleep with me, and, and this temptation kept showing itself uh, every day. Uh, but then Potiphar's wife lied to the servants. And it's interesting that she references, look at what this Hebrew man that my husband brought in did to me. Maybe inflaming some sort of jealousy that had been there among the household servants when this outsider had been brought in to be placed in charge of them. Interestingly enough, this is the second time that Joseph's clothing was used to bring a false report about him, right? The brothers had taken the coat of many colors to their dad and said, look, is this your son's coat? And now the wife is saying, look, here's his, here's his coat, and he left, and this is what happened, and this is why I have the coat. And both times, in both cases, Joseph's going to end up in bondage. So the last part of the story, that is shipwrecked. Uh, let's finish the story out now in verse 16. She put Joseph's garment beside her until his master came home. Then she told him the same story. The Hebrew slave you brought to us came to make a fool of me. But when I screamed for help, he left his garment beside me and he ran outside. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, these are the things your slave did to me. He was furious and had him thrown into prison where the king's prisoners were confined. So Joseph was there in prison. Potiphar was furious. He burned with anger at this report. And, and you could see, again, the wife playing, well, this Hebrew person that you brought in has done this to me. But you know what stood out to me here is, why wasn't Joseph killed for his actions? Right? Like, do you ever think about that? Like, isn't that what you kind of would have expected in this culture is, you know, when, a, when just a, basically a servant, uh, the, a servant of the household tries to rape the master's wife, wouldn't he have just been killed? Why didn't that happen here? Now, commentators have a couple of different thoughts about this. First and foremost is that God protected Joseph. Right? God wasn't going to allow that to happen. God had a plan, and he wasn't going to let anything derail that. Another commentator suggests maybe Potiphar didn't fully believe his wife. I mean, he knew who Joseph was. He knew that God was with Joseph. He saw Joseph's character day in and day out, and he gets this report that's totally out of character for Joseph. Maybe... maybe Potiphar didn't fully believe what his wife said, but neither here nor there, we know Joseph wasn't killed. And so as we look at this story, of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, what's, what's the lesson for us? What, what can we learn from this? What can we apply? And, and here's the big idea. Uh, refuse the sin. Let's unpack that idea for the remaining minutes that we have together. You know, sin can bring everything around us crashing down. When we give in to sin, when, when we give in to temptation, it can have disastrous results. The Bible is full of stories of people who didn't refuse the sin, people who, unlike Joseph, gave in, and it had disastrous consequences for them. Your life may have a story like that, or, or you may have people around you in your life, or people that you've admired and looked up to from afar, uh, and you have found out things or read things where they weren't who we thought they were. And it has tremendous fallout and consequences, not only for them, but for the people in their lives. This is such an important topic. It's such an important thing for us to think and talk about because we are called to be holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 says, For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. God is a God of holiness. And so when we talk about the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, it's primarily a story about sexual temptation, about sexual sin. And that may be something that's in your life that you're wrestling with. But there's a lot of other things, a lot of other areas where we face 
temptation. It could be financial integrity, doing the right things there. It, it could be we're, we're cutting corners just to try to get ahead. Our temptation could come in the form of what we do for entertainment, uh, the things that we do in our spare time or the things that we watch on TV. It could be a, a chase for vanity or a desire for revenge. It could be a love of fame and power, a greed for money, a desire for beauty, or it could just be forsaking our time with God. But I think in the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, there's a couple of things that are really important, a couple of keys that we can take from what Joseph did when we're faced with that same temptation. Did you see in verse 8 what it says Joseph did? It just says, but he refused. I mean, that's it, really, isn't it? That's the secret formula to resisting temptation. Joseph didn't have any special spiritual strengths that you don't have. Joseph didn't have this extra heavy-duty shield of temptation-proof protection around him. Joseph didn't have some sort of secret sauce to resisting that. It just says Joseph refused. That's, that's what he did. And when it got so bad, he, he fled. He literally left his coat in her hands and ran away. He was not going to tolerate it. Look at the contrast in Scripture between how a wise person deals with temptation and how an unwise person deals with it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. It says that a wise man flees from it. It says, verse 18, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. It's underscoring the importance here of just fleeing, run away. That, you know, that, that may be extreme. It may sound that way, but that's literally how important this is, is when it comes down to it, flee, run away, don't be around it. But look at what Scripture says, how an unwise person handles it. Proverbs chapter 7, verses 7 through 10. I saw among the inexperienced, I noticed among the youths, a young man lacking sense. Crossing the street near her corner, he strolled down the road to her house at twilight, in the evening, in the dark of the night. A woman came to meet him dressed like a prostitute, having a hidden agenda. The unwise person is contrasted here with not only not fleeing and running the other way, but just kind of dabbling around the edges. But her enticing is too strong for people to get away from. What temptation in your life do you need to be fleeing from? Maybe it's sexual temptation like this story, but maybe it's one of those other things that we talked about. And in that moment when we're tempted to give in to the sin and we're not refusing like we need to, have we forgotten that God has something much bigger for us? And yet just a simple decision or two in the wrong direction can bring that all crashing down. Sin may seem pleasurable for a season, but Joseph didn't yield to temptation because he was convinced that God had something marvelous for him to do. And Joseph was not going to throw away God's blessings for the pleasures of sin. And you and I were called to do the same thing. So when you're in that moment and you're facing the temptation, let me give you four keys to refusing temptation. These ideas uh, somewhat come from the book called Joseph by Charles Swindoll. But let me give you four keys to refusing temptation. The first is that you must not be weakened by your situation. You must not be weakened by your situation. Look at Joseph, for example. Jo Joseph had it made, didn't he, when you read this story? I mean, economically, he was secure. Uh, vocationally, uh, in his job, he was respected, and he had the ultimate trust. Uh, personally, he was handsome. He was respected by the people around them. He could have allowed this to weaken his resolve. Right To give in to opportunity, to, to look at a situation and think, I, I can handle it. I've got all of the security in all these other areas. He could have been tempted to, to let his guard down because of the position that he had. But he wasn't weakened by his situation. And the second one ties into this. You must not be deceived by the persuasion. You must not be deceived by the persuasion. You, your, your temptation that you face, it, it's going to have just the right words. It's going to have just the right thing to say to you to try to convince you it's okay. Things like, no one will find out. 
Is it really that big of a deal? You know, God, would, God would want you to be happy. Just this once. Everyone else is doing it. I deserve this. It will be worth it. You know, in these moments of temptation, what are, what are we really saying? When we're willing to cross a line to get something that we know we shouldn't get, when we're giving into that sin, in that moment, what we're ultimately saying is that God is not enough for me. God is not enough to fulfill the needs and the desires and the wants that I have, and so I'm going to take things into my own hands and do things that I know I shouldn't do, but, but I deserve it, or I need it, or I want it, or I, I won't ever do it again because God in the moment is not filling this need for me. That's really what we're saying when it comes to temptation, but we must not be deceived by the persuasion. The third one is that you must not be gentle with your emotions. You must not be gentle with your emotions. What do I mean by that? Your feelings, your inner feelings, they're going to plead for satisfaction. That voice in the back of your mind is going to be, begin talking to you. and The temptation will beg for understanding. But look at what Joseph did with Potiphar's wife. It says, Joseph refused to even listen to her. In the English Standard Version, in verse 10, it reads this, And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her to lie beside her, or to be with her. I mean, Joseph just got probably downright rude with her and said, enough, I don't, I don't want to hear that anymore. He refused to even be around her until finally in verse 12, he fled. When our emotions begin talking to us in our heads, we, we must be steadfast. We have to refuse to even give it a listen, to even give it a voice. And then the last one, you must not be confused with the immediate results. Don't be confused with the immediate results. Let me take this two different directions. First, we won't always be rewarded. Right? Like, like if we make the right decision, there may not be trumpets playing in our honor. Uh, look at Joseph's, for, Joseph's story, for example. Joseph, was, he made the right decision, but he was falsely accused, and he was thrown into prison where he stayed for a really long time. Did, did he make the wrong decision? If you make the right decision, you may lose your job. You may lose a relationship. You may lose acceptance from a group. You might be thrown out of the club, so to speak. You say, wait a minute, why, why, are, why are these things happening to me? I thought I made the right decision. That, that isn't the way it's always going to work. We can't be confused with the immediate results. And the flip side of that is also true. <laughs> In the immediate aftermath of giving in to temptation, we may think we got away with it. It may seem like no one knows, or it may seem like everything's in the past. But Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 reminds us, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. It may be true that another person, another human, may not know what we did. And maybe they don't ever find out, but God knows and God sees, and so in the moment when we give in to that temptation, we think, well, that, that wasn't so bad. It seems like I got away with it. Don't be confused by that result. So the four things. You must not be weakened by your situation. You must not be deceived by the persuasion. You must not be gentle with your emotions, and you must not be confused with the immediate results. Now, as we bring this to a close, you, you might be listening to this and thinking, you know, I have given in to that temptation. I have gone too far. I've done things that I'm not supposed to do. I've, I've sinned too much, and God could never forgive me for that. Joel, you, you don't know how bad it's been. And then here's what I would say to you. I would just remind you from Scripture that God is faithful and just to forgive our sins. If we go and we confess our sins to Him, God promises to forgive us. There's nothing that we've done that God won't forgive. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be damage that needs to be repaired or that there won't be consequences to our actions. But God's grace does cover a multitude of sins. Remember those verses that we focused in on last week. Let me read just a couple of them. For you, Psalm 103, verses 2 through 5, and verses 11 and 12. My soul, bless the Lord, and do not forget all his benefits. He forgives all 
your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with good things. Your youth is renewed like the eagle. Verse 11, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His faithful love towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Regardless of where you are, you know, it's not too late to make it right. It's not too late to seek forgiveness from those that you've hurt and from God. Now, you could take this the other way. You could take this to the extreme, right? And say, well, if God's just going to forgive me, then what's really the big deal uh, about giving in to temptation? I, I know I can be forgiven after the fact. Well, we can't take that the other way. In fact, the Apostle Paul anticipated that question. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 says, Well, what should we say, that, say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do we sin that grace may abound? That's why we started with this idea. We are called to a life of holiness. We are called to refuse the sin. We're called to live a life pleasing and devoted to God. We can refuse the sin in the same way that Joseph did with Potiphar's wife. Don't sacrifice a long-term reward in order to have short-term pleasure. And when you're faced with that temptation and you're faced with the sin and it's right there, remember those four keys. Remember that God has called us to a life of holiness. Thanks for being with us this week. I will be praying for you as you face the temptations that are going to come your way this week that you will refuse the sin. If you ever need someone to talk to or you've got some questions about some of the things that you've heard or you need some help, feel free to reach out to us. Send us an email. Give us a phone call. We'd love to be able to pray with you and to encourage one another in that way.